First Bible reading is taken from John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. The Word became flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Second reading from Colossians, chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. Verses, verse 15. The supremacy of the Son of God. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether forms and power or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This is the word of the God of God. As we continue in our series, Paradise to Prison, from Genesis 1 to 3, you might remember that we first began by orienting ourselves in the battle against this foundational book of the Bible, Genesis, through the critics. We considered how the attacks against this book of Genesis have been going on increasingly for the last 250 years. And from the standpoint of the skeptic, that's a wise move, because if you can destroy the foundation, the building will eventually tumble as well. And we especially emphasized that the Christian, our job as a Christian, is to choose to trust the revelation of the infallible God from the very first verse, rather than choosing to trust the changing and contradictory opinions of fallible men. And now in part two, we will consider the importance of Genesis for the Christian, specifically in how we develop a consistent Christian understanding of the world, or what we might call a Christian worldview. And along the way, we want to hone in on Genesis 1.1, understand its background of the whole book, but then really hone in to that first verse and understand a bit more about it, a bit more than we've already seen already. And what we'll see over and over again is that Genesis is absolutely foundational in order to understand the rest of God's word and to develop a distinctly Christian worldview, which all of us must do. A Christian is not going to be able to think properly or live consistently if they don't have a distinctly Christian worldview. And the place that comes from is, or at least the place that is the foundation, is Genesis. And then it carries on through the rest of Scripture. This is what Paul tells us in the book of Romans. That we need to have our minds, our hearts, constantly renewed in God's word. So that when we come to Christianity, each of us brings assumptions, we bring backgrounds, we bring beliefs that may not be in line with God's word. And so as we bring those and we come to the scripture, the scripture needs to speak to those things. Sometimes we need to get rid of long-held beliefs. Sometimes we need to have them tweaked a little bit. And we need to embrace new beliefs that the Bible clearly teaches. And that all starts in Genesis. And so we begin with this question. What makes these opening chapters of Genesis so vital for what we believe and how we see the world? What makes them so vital? Well, there will be three elements, there are many more, but three elements that we will emphasize. First is Christian doctrine. We spoke last week and mentioned that ideas have consequences. 
And let me just say a bit more about that. What you believe determines what you think. And what you think determines what you do. And what you do dominates your life. Let me say that again because that sequence is vitally important. What you believe determines how you think. And what you think determines what you do. And what you do dominates your life. And so it's incumbent upon us as Christians to go back to first principles. What are we believing? What are our starting presuppositions, our starting assumptions and beliefs? And in order to do that, we have to go back to Genesis. And Genesis is chock full of the starting place for Christian doctrine or a Christian understanding of the world. Almost all Christian truths or doctrines are first encountered in these opening chapters. Not just in Genesis as a whole, but just in the first three chapters. In fact, classically, the doctrines of Christianity are known as systematic theology. Theology, theos, the study of God, and systematic just meaning we sequentially look at what the Bible says about God and about other major themes from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. And generally speaking, classically speaking, I should say, there are ten categories of Christian doctrine or systematic theology. Let me list them for you briefly. The doctrine of man, sin, salvation, what's known as God proper, that is, who, who is the person of God, the essence of God, I should say, and the Father. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the church, the end times, and then angels and demons and spiritual forces, and finally, the Bible. Now, those are not in a particular order, but those are the ten categories. Now, what's instructive for us to understand is that of those ten primary categories or themes in the Bible... Nine out of ten of them are first mentioned in Genesis 1, 2, or 3. Now, as soon as I say that, I think some of you are really curious what the one is that's not mentioned. So let me mention that. The one that's not mentioned is the church. The doctrine of the church, you might remember, was a mystery. Something that was not instituted by God until the New Testament age, although it was always his intention. The church is first mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew. And that's important, actually, and it's a a distinct connection to the book of Genesis for this reason. Matthew begins his book and indicates for us that we should consider his book to be connected to Genesis. And we'll see why that is later. But why is Matthew doing that? Because Matthew is saying in his gospel, the, the new creation, Genesis speaks about the old creation, the first creation. The new creation, the new heavens and the new earth have begun. Something new is transpiring. Why? Because Jesus, the creator, the king, has arrived in his creation. And that's what Matthew begins his gospel account with. And of course, because of that, then he introduces later on, on the, on the lips of Jesus himself, the first instance of the word church in the New Testament. The new people of God, this new thing God is forming as he begins the process of redemption. But isn't all this instructive for us, that almost every major doctrine, and many of the minor doctrines as well, are all mentioned in the first three chapters of Genesis? That means, among many other implications, that whatever else these chapters are, they are clearly significant if you want to know the Bible's teaching on every area of life. If you want to have a consistent Christian understanding of the world, you have to understand Genesis. And furthermore, the great doctrine of special creation of all things is, of course, mentioned right from the very first verse. And so for all these areas of doctrine, Genesis requires our careful attention. But it's not just a foundation for doctrinal understanding. It also helps us to have a distinctly Christian worldview. For those who aren't aware of of what worldview studies or the consideration of a worldview is, a worldview or philosophy is your way of looking at the world and making sense of it. And every worldview or way of looking at the world has to answer four questions. Questions of origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Where do I come from? What's the meaning or purpose in this world? Morality, what's right or wrong? How do I know it? And fourthly, destiny. Where am I going? Is there something after death? Is there eternity? How do I think about that? And as each worldview or each religious system answers those four questions, you can't just answer them disconnectedly. They all have to connect together. They have to be internally coherent, and they have to connect to the real world. They have to really make sense and cohere or work together. That's exactly what happens in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. All four are answered, and the connection between them is shown clearly. And so without a proper understanding of Genesis 1 to 3, as well as the rest of the book of Genesis, 
you cannot have a consistent Christian worldview. And if you're not seeing the world and reality the way that you properly should as a Christian, then you're not going to be able to act in a, a Christian way. You're not going to be able to live consistently as a Christian. And this is exactly the calamity that we're seeing today with many Christians, many churches, many Christian organizations, where those who claim to be a Christian are not acting like Christians. They're not upholding biblical values. They're not speaking Christian words. They're not acting like Christ. Why? Well, one of two reasons. Either they're a false Christian, they're religious but not really a Christian, and they're deceived, or they're a true Christian, but they have not developed in their thinking and understanding. In essence, they are still quite immature in their development, and they need to be renewed in the spirit of their mind, as Romans says, through the word of God, so that they can think clearly as a Christian instead of bringing in unchristian or non-Christian ideas into the Bible and into their way of thinking. Everyone has a worldview, and the Christian needs to have a distinctly Christian worldview. So the, the question is not, do I have a worldview or do I not? The question is, as a Christian, is my worldview consistently a Christian one based on the Bible, or is it something else? And this is a, something that will develop along the process of our Christian experience in life. Every point at which you're reading the Bible and you realize, wait, my starting point on that topic is different than what the Scripture says, we have to tweak our thinking and our belief and our action based upon what God's Word says. This is why I said Genesis is absolutely foundational in order to understand the rest of God's Word and to develop a distinctly Christian worldview. Now, if this topic of worldviews is a bit new to you, that's okay. I would highly recommend two resources for you. There's a great book called The Universe Next Door by James Sire, in which he discusses different worldviews and how a Christian worldview is different than the other worldviews. But if you're wanting to develop a distinctly Christian worldview, there are many resources out there. One, I would suggest, is by Francis Schaeffer, and it's entitled, How Shall We Then Live?, but this is instructive for us, and it's a vitally important element of our Christianity. But it's not just Christian doctrine. It's not just developing a Christian worldview. It's also the understanding of origins, where things came from. The word origins means beginning or first. And Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and the whole of the book, is filled with origins. I'm going to give you a sample list. This is not exhaustive, but it's some of the major origins or firsts or beginning points in this foundational book. And just think of how radically important all of these are for us to understand the world around us. First of all, there's the origin of the universe and solar system right there in Genesis 1.1. And Genesis 1.1, as we've already begun to see, is unique amongst all the literature and all the scientific philosophies of the world. Every other system of what's known as cosmogony, that's the study of explaining the universe, every other system or story of cosmogony whether ancient uh, religious myths or certain mo modern scientific models or theories, they all start with eternal matter and energy. Or they have no explanation for matter and energy. So they pick up where matter and energy are already there and are reworked in some way. There's, there's this fundamental starting point that's unique to Genesis 1.1. Only the book of Genesis starts with the eternal God who creates the universe out of nothing. We also see the origin of order and complexity, which are vitally important to the workings of the solar system. We see the introduction of the atmosphere and the hydrosphere in the creation account. We see the origin of man, mankind that is possessed not only of innumerable, innumerable intricate physical chemical structures that are vital to life and reproduction, but beyond the physical part of man, there's a nature which can gloriously contemplate abstract ideas, which can consider things like beauty and love and worship, which can't be placed in a test tube. And mankind is unique among all the creation in this world. We are the only ones to be able to do that and simultaneously to think and reflect on our own meaning and our own identity. The true record of man's beginning or creation, origin, is in Genesis. We have the origin of marriage as well. 
that remarkable, universal, and stable institution of marriage, family, and home. And this God-given, monogamous, patriarchal social structure is defined and described in Genesis as having been ordained by the Creator for our good, the good of humanity. Whereas polygamy, infanticide, matriarchy, promiscuity, divorce, abortion, homosexual practice, and many other things are all corruptions of God's good creation. And they're a result of the fall. And so it sets us up right away with marriage and the family in proper parameters. We see the origin of evil and sin, the origin of God's judgment on evil and sin, all in Genesis 3. We see the origin of salvation by grace through God's mercy that even though Adam and Eve sinned, and they deserved death immediately for it, God showed mercy. And he immediately instituted a sacrifice system to teach humanity that there must be a payment for sin and to point forward to that one who would one day be the substitute for human sin. Because, of course, animals cannot take away our sin. Genesis 3.15 is the first mention of the gospel in the whole of the Bible, called the Proto-Evangelion. That is, Proto-First Evangelion Gospel. The first mention of the good news of Jesus Christ is given right away, right after the sin of Adam and Eve. We see the origin of language, Genesis 11, the origin of clothing. Why do we wear clothing around the world, other than the fact that it's sometimes extremely cold or extremely warm? Where does clothing come from? What's its purpose? Why is it there? Who instituted it? All of that's Genesis 1 to 3. The seven-day week, where does that come from? Straight from the mouth of God, Genesis 1 to 3. The origin of government, straight from God in Genesis. He institutes it, and he tells us how it should operate, what its purpose is, and how it should function. And we should follow that. And when we do not follow that, it leads to chaos. The origin of culture. We see in Genesis the introduction of, among other things, urbanization. The development of metallurgy, of music, musical instrumentation, agriculture, Animal husbandry, writing, education, navigation, textiles, and ceramics, just to name a few. It all starts in Genesis. You find in Genesis the origin of natures, uh, nations and cultures linked with language groups, Genesis 11. You find in the book of Genesis the origin of religion, both the true religions and the, the false religions. Systems of worship and conduct. You see the origin of the chosen people of God, Genesis chapter 12. All of this is in Genesis. Genesis is a book of beginnings or origins. Either you believe Genesis or you don't. But what is really intolerable, and it's all too much in vogue today, is for Christians to say, oh, I believe the Bible, but I just don't really believe parts of Genesis or the creation account. That's just another way of saying, I believe the Bible, but I don't really believe the Bible. It's a contradiction in terms. You and I do not have the authority to tell God which parts of his word we will and will not accept. That is not our prerogative. It is for him to speak and us to respond with submission and acceptance. Our sole source of the knowledge of the origins of all things is the Bible. And the alternative, as we've already seen, naturalistic evolution, is an act of irrational faith. Creation, conversely, is an act of revelational faith. Naturalistic evolution is a modern religious sect or idea that denies reason and denies revelation. And this is why the Christian must choose to trust the revelation of the infallible God from the very first verse instead of trusting the contradictory and compromised words of fallible men. I must confess to you, you have no idea how much stuff I've cut out of this sermon. So I'm I'm skipping over something else, all right? But maybe we'll come back to it. There, There is so much to consider because Genesis is so foundational. But perhaps that's enough for that portion. Not only are these opening chapters of the Bible vital if we're going to understand Christian doctrine, to understand and develop a distinctly Christian worldview, and to understand the origins of all things. But now let's move on to the glories of Genesis 1-1 itself, to, to understand it more fully. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
I'll give two background elements that might be helpful. First of all, the author and then the name of the book itself. The author is Moses, but he's not the author uh, in the same sense that he's the author of the other four books of the Pentateuch. It's far more likely he's the compiler or the editor, or both, of the book of Genesis. Because you might remember these other four books of the Pentateuch, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. He was an eyewitness for everything that happened there, and he clearly wrote that down. But with Genesis, those, those events happened long before his day. But there's good reason to believe that he took pre-existing documents and put them together into their final form. And so in that sense, he certainly is the author. We might better refer to him as the editor and compiler, putting it into its final form. And the book of Genesis itself, its name, it comes from within the book. That is, in the Hebrew language, the word generation, which is mentioned over and over again in the book, these are the generations of Adam, these are the generations of Noah, these are the generations of Abraham. That phrase is a major phrase that's repeated time and time again throughout the book. And that word, generations, in Hebrew is the word toledoth, uh, or toledot, first mentioned in Genesis 2.4. And I remind us, in, in case uh, you're unaware, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, primarily a little bit of Aramaic. But later on, about 130 years before Jesus stepped onto the stage in this world, the, the primary language of that day was Greek, and so some of the Jewish scholars had translated from the Hebrew and Aramaic into Greek, a Greek translation of the Old Testament known as the Septuagint or Septuagint, often um, designated by the Roman numerals LXX, 70. And this Septuagint translated the word Toledot, generations, as the word Genesis in Greek. And so from that, that became our title for the book. Now, this understanding is important. More, it's more than just a, a really interesting tidbit of Hebrew language. It's actually quite important for us for two reasons. Because it connects directly to two of the New Testament gospel accounts. Both the gospel writers, Matthew and John, play off of that title and that terminology in the first chapters of their gospels. And that means if you fail to understand kind of that title and that terminology and what's going on in Genesis, you're going to fail to understand what Matthew and John are doing, respectively, in, at the very beginning of their books as they introduce Jesus to us. Matthew 1.1 1, 1 says this, This is, or these are, the generations of Jesus the Messiah, son of David, son of Abraham. Literally, if we were to transliterate it, he says this is the genesis of Jesus the Messiah. He's directly quoting from and playing off of multiple passages in the book of Genesis using that moniker, which had become the title of the book of Genesis, in order to tell you and I, the readers, in essence, this is the book of Genesis, part two, volume two. Why? Because the one who created in the beginning has now stepped into his creation, and he's doing something amazing, and I'm introducing him to you. That's what Matthew's doing at the very beginning. And that connection is vitally important for the whole of the rest of Matthew's gospel. But now let's consider a few more of the elements of the verse itself. In the beginning, God. Who is this God? I remind us, this opening verse of the Bible is unique. It's the foundation of foundations. It, these may be the first words ever written down, either revealed to Adam and written down by him, or written by God himself, as he later did on the tablets of stone with the Ten Commandments. In Genesis 1.1, if you understand it, and if you not just understand what it says, but if you believe it, in the beginning God created, it causes so much of the rest of the Bible to fall into place in your mind, in your heart. For instance, it's, it's quite popular these days, in the last 20, 30, 40 years especially, for those who claim to believe the Bible as the authority and straight from God, that they try to pick apart different parts of the Bible and say, well, that part's legitimate, but that part's not. And after they do that with Genesis, they do it with other parts. So one thing that's in vogue these days is to say, among other things, that the book of Jonah in the Old Testament, that Old Testament prophet, that it's just a fictitious story to teach us a lesson. It's not real history. There probably wasn't a real guy named Jonah, or if there was, he never got swallowed by a fish or, or a whale. But if you consider, if there is an all-powerful creator of the universe, God, who made everything, including every sea-dwelling creature, then it's not much of a stretch to think that if God chooses, he can choose one of those sea creatures to go and swallow someone. 
And in fact, if we had time, we could look throughout history and there are other instances of people being swallowed by large fish or whales. But what's going on there? It's a person who has jettisoned the beginning of the scriptures, and so then they become the authority to say which parts of the Bible they will or will not, will not accept. If there's an eternal, all-powerful creator, then having that creator step into his universe, if he chooses, is not a stretch. Having him do a miraculous event within the history of the world, that's perfectly acceptable. If we understand that this is the all-powerful God who created the world. Once again, this is why we have to stress that Genesis is the absolute foundation point for us to understand all of God's word and to develop that Christian worldview. God, that term here in English, is the Hebrew word Elohim, one of the old Hebrew uh, names for God. That's the eternal one who exists before the creation. He's the one who is omnipotent, all-powerful, the creator of the universe. There's nothing impossible for that God. And notice there's no attempt in this verse to try to prove the existence of God. Now, there's validity to uh, books that have been written and arguments that have been made, usually from a philosophical perspective, on various proofs for why we should believe God exists. Those are true. And that's appropriate in a certain sphere. God doesn't start that way. He doesn't try to prove to us his existence. He just asserts himself. Because he doesn't need our permission for him to exist. If he's the creator and he is God and we are the creatures, then it's for him to speak, us to listen and obey. And that's how he begins. John Stott has a great quote in his book, Basic Christianity. He says this, In the beginning, God. The first four words of the Bible are more than a way of launching the story of creation or introducing the book of Genesis. They supply the key that opens our understanding to the Bible as a whole. They tell us that the religion of the Bible is a religion in which God takes the initiative. The Bible isn't about people trying to discover God, but about God reaching to us. And that's exactly right. The book of Genesis begins by explaining to us that God is choosing to reveal himself to us and initiating that relationship. But we go on in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God, Elohim, creates. What, is, what does that mean, create? In what sense? Because there are several Hebrew words that can be used there. But this is the word bara, which means to create out of nothing. And that's vitally important because the other Hebrew words are not about creating out of nothing. It's about reforming what's already there. Does that make sense? So a, a person who takes existing materials, some boards of wood, some nails and screws, and a hammer, and puts them together to make a bookshelf, they are creating something, but it's taking already existing materials to make something. That's really better referred to as sub-creation, because you didn't come up with the materials yourself. You're just reforming already existing materials. But when it comes to God in Genesis 1-1, he's not taking anything that already existed. He's bringing it all into existence and forming it simultaneously out of nothing by simply speaking it into existence. And that's vitally important because so many other, in fact, all the other scientific theories or other myths about the creation of the world are all about taking pre-existing material and just having it reformed. That's not what Genesis 1.1 says. Hebrews 11.3 also tells us, By faith we understand the universe was formed by God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. What is that saying? It means everything that came to be, all of creation, all the things we see, were created by a being who is not visible, who is not bound by space, time, and matter. He is a spirit. It was not made out of pre-existing material. Yet, it is of interest to realize that what's become known, this is just a tidbit in history, but it's fascinating and we'll come back to it as we go through the series. What's come to be known as the Big Bang Theory, when that was first introduced, many scientists rejected it, not for, not for scientific reasons. Their main objection to the Big Bang Theory was it sounds way too much like Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth. Boom, it's all there. And so they rejected it out of hand because they said it sounded way too much like Genesis 1-1, the very thing they were trying to get away from. Colossians 1.16 tells us that Jesus Christ was there 
in the beginning with the Father and the Spirit. And actually, it was he who created the world. He created what was visible and invisible. You see a mountain visible, he created that. You cannot see the wind, but we know it's there. He created that too. You see the ocean, he created that. You cannot see the electrical current that's going through the air right now, but he created that too. He created everything, visible and invisible. And I stress again that the majority of the world's creation myths and many supposedly scientific theories postulate this eternal matter. That's not what the Bible says. You and I must either, and this is, this is essential, this is the point we've been leading up to so far for this portion, you and I must either believe in an eternal God or in eternal matter. It's either in the beginning God or in the beginning dirt. I'm going to say that again because I know it sounds strange. It's either in the beginning God or in the beginning dirt. And naturalistic evolution says in the beginning dirt is scientific and rational. It's not. But I do, we do also need to pause here. Because Genesis 1.1, it should be stated, is not an absolute beginning point for everything there is. And I'm using my wording quite purposefully here. It's not an absolute beginning point of everything that came to exist or everything that is. Uh, this is Genesis 1.1 is the beginning of space, time, and matter. Some atheists are fond of responding to Christians when we say, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. They say, but who created God? As if that's a gotcha question. But it shows they really haven't done their research. They really haven't looked into it or understood even what they're asking because by definition, the God of the Bible is uncreated. He is what's called in philosophy the uncaused caused or the unmoved mover as Plato and Socrates like to say. The God of the Bible is uncaused. He's uncreated. He's the one who brought space, time, and matter into existence. But he himself is a spirit. He doesn't need space, time, and matter. He doesn't dwell in space, time, and matter unless he chooses to come into it, which he has done in the past. He's not bound by it. He created it. And so everything that came to exist came from God. But God never came to exist. So we don't need to ask who created God. By definition, he never came to exist. He has always existed. And this can be illustrated for us uh, just with a box. It's what's known as the closed system or an open system. Naturalistic evolution suggests we live in a system like a box that's closed. That is, we're inside the box, all space, time, and matter is inside the box, and they assume there cannot be anything outside the box. Not just, we don't know if there's anything outside the box, but there cannot be anything out there. So all we can see is what's in the box, and that's what we do in our test tubes and science laboratories, and, and that can lead to some great outcomes. The problem is, you're starting with a metaphysical assumption, a non-scientific assumption that this is a closed system. The Bible and the biblical worldview, the Christian worldview, as opposed to that, says we live in an open system. We could open the box if we need to to illustrate that. But it's the idea, yes, we live in the box. We are bound by space, time, and matter. But the God who created the box, the God who created the universe and space, time, and matter, he exists outside of it. He doesn't need it. He can enter into it when he wants, or he cannot. But he is not bound by that. So therefore, it's completely illegitimate when some scientists or philosophers say, science has disproved God. No, it can't. Science can only consider what's in the box. God, by definition, is outside the box. So you cannot prove or disprove him by mere science. And this makes sense of miracles. Miracles are not violations of the laws of nature. This is what naturalistic evolutionists will tell you. They are not violations of nature's laws. They are additions to nature's laws. Natural laws just express constants. That is, we, the, the speed of light is particularly this, generally speaking. But could it change? Absolutely. Even scientists will express that in certain instances. It could theoretically change. Well, God is outside of space, time, and matter. He can insert himself. It's a bit like this. It's the prerogative of a computer programmer to change the program, change the coding, if he needs to. But no one would then accuse him of 
breaking and destroying the laws of computer engineering. No, he's just doing what he's doing. He, he is the creator outside the machine, in this case a computer machine, uh, that is inserting something or modifying it. That's his prerogative as the creator. Well, God's prerogative is to enter into his world, and sometimes, and we know from the scripture he does this sometimes, although it's occasional, to do what we might refer to as a supernatural event or, or a miracle. But that in no way violates the natural order of space, time, and matter. But very significantly, the concept of, of the special creation of the universe, Genesis 1.1, in order to understand that and glory in it well, we have to understand a bit more about space, time, and matter. Briefly, you remember that we considered what Herbert Spencer said last week, that all that is can be summarized in these five words, time, force, action, space, and matter. And then we briefly stated Genesis 1.1 with that consideration. In the beginning, that's time, God, that's force, created, that's energy, you might say, or action. The heavens, that's space, and the earth, that's matter. All five are stated in Genesis 1.1. But it gets better, and I hope you're ready for this. Some of you need to get ready to get excited, okay? Space, time, matter. I know some of us are maybe not as uh, scientifically or philosophically inclined. That's fine. You don't have to be to get this and to enjoy this and to appreciate this and give God glory for this. Science and philosophy tell us you must have all three, space, time, and matter, coming into existence at the exact same instant, or it doesn't work. Why? Because if you have space but no time, where would you, or when would you put it? And if you have matter but no space, where are you going to put it? You have to have all three. They're all complementary. You need all three simultaneously. And Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning, time, God created the heavens, space, and the earth, matter. It all comes into existence like that. That's fantastic. Are you aware of what the word universe means, if you break it down? The word universe means a single spoken sentence or a single statement. Uni, one verse statement. One sentence, one statement. Genesis 1.1, God gives a single spoken statement, and the universe is. That's amazing. At the same time that we have this, what's sometimes referred to as a triunity of space, time, and matter coming into existence all at once, we also see in that same verse the mention of Elohim, which is an intriguing title for God in the Old Testament. That is the uni-plural Old Testament designation for God. What I mean by that is it is plural in form, but singular in meaning. We're not sure about this, but perhaps it's already hinting at what we are later told in the New Testament, that God has eternally existed as three persons in one essence, the Trinity. If that's the case, what that would mean is the plural unity God, Father, Son, and Spirit, bring into existence at the exact instant the triunity of space, time, and matter. And all of that is Genesis 1.1. Do you see how glorious this is? How wonderful this is? How completely different to every other religion or philosophy or worldview Genesis 1.1 is? It's, it's the foundation starting point, but it's also completely different starting point to everything else. I, I know we are a subdued congregation, generally speaking. So many times... We don't have people yelling out amen or praise the Lord or anything like that. But something like this should get you excited enough to where even if you won't stand up right at this moment, I wish you would, but even if you won't stand up right at this moment and say, praise God, at least you'll do it on the inside. Because remember what we've been seeing, God deserves the praise for what he's done and what he's told us. And so maybe a good way to respond in our hearts and minds right at this moment is the words of that wonderful Christian song, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We wrap this up with two considerations. First of all, as Christians, we must understand that Genesis is absolutely foundational for our understanding as Christians and for our distinctly Christian worldview, which we are commanded, not just suggested, but it's a command in Scripture for us to develop that Christian worldview and live by it. But secondly, and we'll end with this, we've already considered how Genesis is connected to two gospel accounts. 
we discussed briefly about Matthew's gospel, but let's end with John 1.1 1, 1 in John's gospel account. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. You can't say it more clearly. He made everything. Everything that came to exist, he made. Hebrews 1 tells us that Jesus, as well as John 1.1, 1, 1, Hebrews 1 tells us Jesus was there with the Father and the Spirit, creating, and that he was actually creating himself, as Colossians also tells us. So who is this Word of God, capital W? It's Jesus. And we see something interesting when that same Jesus, the creator from Genesis 1, enters into a physical body, into his creation in John 1.1. Throughout John's gospel, throughout the other gospel accounts, we see something interesting happening. And that is certain times when Jesus speaks, his words, his voice, carry a strange power. John 11, he speaks a few words and, and Lazarus comes back from the dead. Or... In another instance, he says, don't wonder, the hour is coming when everyone in their graves, everyone who's dead, will hear my voice. That is a strange thing to say, if you're merely a human being. Or, my words are spirit and life. Yes, they are, because they brought all life into existence in Genesis 1.1. That's fantastic. But in the same way, that it's amazing to consider God as the creator, perhaps we should be equally or more greatly moved that that God, the creator, would humble himself voluntarily, step into a human body, come into this world that he had created among human beings who did not recognize him in order to purchase our salvation. There's a wonderful Christian song written a few decades ago Speaking of Jesus on the cross, one of the statements of Jesus on the cross is, I thirst, I'm thirsty. And the songwriter, dwelling on that and the book of Genesis, says this, he said, I thirst, yet he made the rivers. I thirst, but he made the sea. I thirst, said the king of the ages, but in his great thirst, he brought water to me, speaking of that spiritual, life-giving water spoken of in John 4, and that's exactly it. The incongruity of the creator hanging on a cross saying, I'm thirsty, when he is the one who not only created every molecule of water on this planet, but keeps the cycle moving and holds it all together. That requires some grand explanation, which is exactly the explanation he gives us. Jesus came to seek and save the lost, have a personal relationship with you. And as your creator, he was gracious and merciful enough to do it. Do you have that personal relationship with God as your creator? Let's pray. Father, it's so important for us to have our faith again encouraged by the truth of your word. Help us to realize that we don't need to give in to the supposed wisdom of this world and those who don't know you, give us a firm and resolute confidence that your word is true from the very first verse, that every word of God is pure, just as the scripture claims, that it's all by inspiration and without error. Remind us that you created the world in the way that you said, and there wasn't anything in the world that you did not create. Help us to know you not just as our creator, but to know you personally and to hold fast to Genesis and the whole of your word as the only foundation for our thinking and our action in every area of life in this world. We give you praise for what you made and how you made it and that you graciously told us so we can know. We ask that you would strengthen the faith of believers, strengthen our faith in the God who made us, And strengthen our love and cause it to grow for that same creator who stepped in, into his creation to redeem us. We praise you for your greatness, the vastness of your intelligence, your design, your creativity. May we give all the glory to you. And we thank you personally. 
for the great mercy you've shown us. And I finally ask, Lord, if there is anyone here who's not experienced that mercy themselves, they don't have that relationship with you, their creator, that today they might come to know you personally through Jesus. We ask this in your name. Amen.